Hello, welcome everyone to the City of Yes info session um, for economic opportunity. I am Lara Marita um, from the New York City Department of City Planning. Before we start, I have a few house housekeeping notes. There will be American Sign Language interpretation throughout the duration of the presentation and conversation today. In addition to ASL, we are offering simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese. Next slide, please. I will now read this and I will ask each of the interpreters to please um, repeat it in the appropriate language. Please click on the interpretation icon for Spanish, Mandarin, or Cantonese to hear a simultaneous interpretation of the session. During the Q&A, staff will be available to provide language assistance for Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese speakers as needed. Spanish and Mandarin or Cantonese speakers, speaking participants may also contact us for additional assistance via email at DCP City of Yes underscore DL at planning.nyc.gov. Would the Spanish interpreter please read from the slide? Madeline, would you please read the section in Spanish? Uh, please go back to the last slide. Madeline, can you hear me? Yes, can I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you just need to uh, exit your second. Uh, your second screen name. I think that's creating the echo. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Uh, could you read the section in Spanish? Yes. Por favor, haga clic en, las, en el símbolo de interpretación en español, mandarín o cantonés para escuchar la interpretación simultánea de la sesión durante la sesión de preguntas y respuestas estará disponible asistencia para la interpretación en español mandarín, cantonés, para quien lo necesite. También nos puede contactar para asistencia adicional al correo electrónico. Es dpccitys subraya dl arroba planning Punto N y C punto G O D. Thank you. Would the Mandarin interpreter please unmic and read from the slide? Let me take care of both language. 请点击同声传译的浮标，以收听会议的西班牙语普通话或粤语的同声传译。在提问环节期间，Q&A工作人员将根据需求为您提供西班牙语普通话或粤语的翻译服务。如需要更多的帮助，请西班牙语普通话
國語或粵語嘅參與者，也可以通過電子郵件嘅方式 d c p c i t y o f y e s 下行線 d l at p l a n n i n g 點 n y c 點 g o v 與我們取得聯絡。Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Okay, so we will start with a presentation and then dedicate the rest of the conversation to hearing from you. During the presentation, if you have questions、um, come to mind, you can submit it by using the Q and A feature. Staff will collect the questions and queue them up for a live Q and A session afterwards. Once the presentation is over, we will move into a Q and A portion of the evening. You will have multiple ways you can participate. You can continue to submit written questions in the Q and A function. Or you can raise your hand if you wish to ask your question. When your name is called, you can you will be able to unmic、um, and give you the option to turn on your camera. If you're phoning in, you will press nine and raise your hand, and staff will help you. I will go over these instructions again at the end of the、um, at the end of the presentation. Next slide. In addition, if you're having any technical issues. Please use the call the phone numbers above,、um, the toll free number or the toll numbers eight seven seven eight five three five two four seven or two one two three three eight eight four seven seven. It will ask you to prompt、uh, promptly enter the medium ID, which is eight six four six seven zero six zero. Two zero eight two, and the participant ID. Press pound key, and the password is one.、Um, and somebody will be able to help you when you get onto the call. In addition,、um, the project team can be reached by email at economic opportunity at planning dot nyc dot gov. Next slide. So I'm really excited to have、um, Edith Su Chen join us this evening. She is executive director of the Department of City Planning, and will be offering a few words to start the presentation. Thank you, Lara, and good evening, everyone. I'm Edith Su Chen, executive director at the Department of City Planning, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening to discuss City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. This is the second of Mayor Adams' three City of Yes zoning text amendments, which are collectively aimed at ensuring New York City emerges from the pandemic and into the 21st century a more affordable, more prosperous, and a greener and healthier city. The first of these three initiatives, City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality, entered public review earlier this year in April and is currently being reviewed by 59 community boards and five borough presidents. The first three yes votes from community boards are already in. Next month, this proposal will then come back to the City Planning Commission, and the City Planning Commission will consider all of the public input and vote on the proposal. After that, in the early fall, it will go to the City Council, which will vote on the proposal. So, City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality is aimed at ensuring that New Yorkers can install green energy technologies in their homes and businesses more easily and safely. The proposal seeks to do that by getting outmoded zoning rules out of the way. The second tax amendment, which will be the which we are presenting to you in depth tonight, City of Yes for Economic Opportunity, is about updating our zoning to give all New Yorkers access to vibrant commercial corridors, allowing more New Yorkers to start businesses and create jobs, and make it easier for businesses to grow and expand. And last but not least, later this year we'll host a public info session like this one about the City of Yes initiative for housing opportunity. This third proposal is about changing our zoning regulations to create more housing across the city. It's great to see so many of you here tonight. So thank you very much again for joining us. And now back to you, Lara. Thank you so much, Edith. And now we'll get started with our presentation. So I'm going to introduce Matt. Wasevsky, and、um, uh, he's a senior planner at in our economic and development and regional planning at Department of City of Planning, and he's also the project manager for the City of Yes Economic Opportunity. Matt, I'll hand it off to you. 
Thanks, Lara, and good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Waskevitz. I'm the project manager for City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. You can advance to the next slide, please. My presentation is about 30 minutes long, and we'll have ample time for questions at the end. So please feel free to use the chat function as questions occur to you. We'll also be making this presentation available in its entirety online on our on City Planning's website following today's session. But today's proposal is, as Edith mentioned, one of three citywide initiatives that are meant to modernize and update our city's zoning regulations to support small businesses, create affordable housing, and promote sustainability, all part of Mayor Eric Adams' vision for a more inclusive, equitable city of yes. The other two proposals are City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality, it's currently in public review, and this initiative is designed to help New York City meet its ambitious goal of reducing its carbon emissions by 80% by 2050, by updating its zoning to make it easier to green our buildings, our streets, and our city. City of Yes for Housing Opportunity is an inclusive citywide approach to our city's housing crisis that aims to expand and diversify the housing supply and ensure that every neighborhood does its part to help meet the housing needs and provide equitable access to housing for all New Yorkers. This proposal is expected to start public review next spring. But I'll spend the next 30 minutes focused on City of Yes for Economic Opportunity, which is due to enter into public review later this fall. Next slide, please. We've been on a listening tour at City Planning for much of the last year, asking Chambers of Commerce, Business Improvement Districts, industrial service providers, and other stakeholders across the city, ways that zoning might be getting in the way of establishing or expanding a business. We've met with well over 100 groups, had two public information sessions just like this one, and have heard from countless New Yorkers about the challenges you face. And this proposal has been shaped by your concerns. Next slide, please. And a lot of what we heard is, let's face it, New York City can be a challenging place to run a business. And dealing with government regulation is oftentimes frustrating, slow, confusing, or seemingly logical. And often all of this red tape makes investing in businesses hard. And this in turn contributes to our city being less vibrant, having fewer people able to start their business, having one more vacant storefront, having one more business have to leave their neighborhood or the city overall to expand. Next slide, please. We also know that the pandemic made things even harder for some businesses. But in these difficult times, we also saw silver linings and resilience in the ways that our commercial areas have adapted to crisis. So there are three key effects that we see coming out of the pandemic that are particularly relevant to bear in mind for this initiative. First, even before the pandemic, high storefront vacancy has affected the health of our retail corridors. And many new vacancies arose during the crisis. And while some commercial corridors have bounced back from the pandemic, others have not. And so our ability to ensure that our streets can be repopulate, repopulated with new and expanding businesses remains a chief concern. Second, we recognize that remote work presents challenges to our city's office districts that are also suffering from high vacancy and a period of reinvention. But this also creates an opportunity to reimagine our central business districts, as well as neighborhoods across the city and support business closer to where people are spending more of their time in their home neighborhoods. Third, a number of new industries, such as life sciences, are emerging in ways that can help accelerate the city's recovery and create good jobs in all five boroughs. Next slide, please. So how does zoning affect businesses across the city and in our neighborhoods? Zoning is what sets the stage for how businesses can physically locate in the city because it's how our government sets rules on what kinds of businesses can open, where they can locate, how big they can be, and a number of other parameters that dictate or constrain business location and operation. Next slide, please. And so what we've heard in our outreach is that our rules governing businesses, many of which are 60 years old, are holding our businesses back, either by being too restrictive from businesses outright locating, regulating how they do business, or because of old or complicated rules just not being clear in ways that cost small businesses time and money. We want to make sure that our zoning works for our economy and not against it. And so our overarching vision for this work is to make sure that our zoning is more simple, more adaptable, and more modern. 
Next slide, please. Because ultimately, we think that a city that says yes to business is thriving is one that is better for all of us. Easier pathways for businesses means more kinds of businesses and fewer vacant storefronts. It means more diversity in our neighborhoods, more fun, more family-friendly activities, more jobs, and a city that is just a bit easier to make it in. Next slide, please. And so how do we achieve this? First, we want to expand options for businesses to locate closer to their customers. The main way we propose to do this is by removing zoning restrictions on particular businesses, allowing a wider range of business types to locate in storefronts along our city's commercial corridors. We believe these changes to zoning will allow more businesses to open and combat storefront vacancy by making it easier to fill empty space. Second, we want to support business and industry growth that can help catalyze the city's recovery and create good jobs across all five boroughs. We will do so by removing impediments and, or reducing ambiguity in zoning for specific industries, which will help these emerging businesses thrive across the city. Third, we want to foster more vibrant neighborhoods by increasing the access that New Yorkers have to local goods and services and by activating our commercial streets. Fourth, and finally, we want to give businesses more certainty and predictability on where they can locate and what they can do with their space. We aim to do this by clarifying and modernizing the rules that we have in zoning regulating use or where a kind of business is allowed to occur in a particular area. And so I'll now go through, next slide please. I'll now go through each of the 18 proposals we have to change our zoning to meet each of these goals. Next slide please. So our first goal is about expanding options for businesses to locate. Through our outreach, we've learned a number of ways in which the current zoning is inhibiting business location or expansion in areas that make sense. And so this goal is all about bringing new location options to help businesses grow near their customers. Next slide, please. Our first proposal is about removing zoning restrictions on ground floors. In some of the city's higher density commercial areas, such as Midtown South, as well as commercial corridors like 125th Street in Harlem or Main Street in Flushing, some kinds of businesses that are allowed to locate above the ground floor are prohibited from locating on the ground floor. And so these business types include things like art studios, instructional facilities, and clothing rental businesses. We think these kinds of restrictions make no sense. And so we want to open up allowing these kinds of businesses to locate on the ground floor as well. Next slide, please. Proposal two is about allowing consistent business types in similar zoning districts. Today, our neighborhood retail corridors are typically zoned C1 or C2, while our higher density or more centrally located business districts are typically zoned C4, C5, or C6. While there are sometimes important distinctions between these districts, zoning also sometimes makes some arbitrary distinctions between what kinds of businesses can be allowed to be in each kind of district. So as a result, walking along a street, you may find that on the left side of the street, for example, it allows movie theaters, but on the right side of the street, they're not allowed. Or you might be able to open up a bike sale shop on the right side of the street, but if you want to also rent your bicycles, you would have to be located on the left side of the street instead. And so to simplify these distinctions and treat similar zoning districts in a similar way, we are proposing to allow for a consistent mix of businesses across our C1 and C2 districts and a consistent mix of businesses across our C4, C5, and C6 districts. This would remove the arbitrary barriers we have along corridors that are getting in the way of businesses being able to locate in a particular area. Next slide, please. Proposal number three would allow for small scale clean manufacturing and production spaces to flourish across the city by allowing them for the first time in our commercial districts. So today's zoning does allow for limited kinds of manufacturing to occur in, in Midtown, but it restricts most kinds of production activities to the city's industrial areas. Now there are many kinds of clean production, things like food and beverage making, apparel design, jewelry making, 3D printing, and things like this that are perfectly appropriate to locate in a commercial area and may in fact benefit from being able to locate closer to where their customers are. 
And so these businesses, we must note, would be subject to environmental standards to ensure that they're not creating a negative impact with their neighbors. Next slide, please. Proposal four would expand opportunities for commercial uses above the ground floor. In a residential building today, for the most part, you have uh, commercial uses on the ground floor and residences above. But there are a few ways in which we think it makes sense to allow for commercial uses and residential uses to be allowed in the same building. The first example is in lower density commercial areas, where today you can have a second floor uh, medical office or other kind of office like that. But if that medical office were to go away, there's no way in our zoning to allow for another kind of office to fill that vacant space. So in these kinds of locations, we want to allow for second story commercial spaces. In our higher density areas, mostly in Manhattan, but also in some limited places like Long Island City and downtown Brooklyn, today commercial uses can be above the first or second floor, but you can't allow residences and commercial uses on the same floor in residential buildings. And you also can't allow commercial activities to locate above residences. So we think that as long as these uses are physically separated using separate entrances with separate elevators and separate lobbies, mixed use buildings should be able to be built with commercial uses where it makes sense. And we think this is especially useful for things like observation decks or thinking about a large conversion where different wings of a building with different elevator banks may serve different purposes. Next slide, please. For proposal five, we want to create new loft style zoning tools for jobs districts. Today, low density options, physical design rules and parking requirements make it impossible to build loft-like buildings, even in areas where historically they exist. This proposal would create a range of new job intensive zoning districts at a range of densities and heights that can accommodate the zoning toolkit for future rezonings. Next slide, please. On to our second goal. We wanna support growing industries by unlocking new space and encouraging new business models. So this goal is about addressing ways that zoning might be getting in the way or creating confusion for a particular emerging industry that can help the city accelerate its recovery. Next slide, please. First, on life sciences, it's a growing industry in the city today. And so we wanna make sure that our zoning is clear on what kinds of life sciences activities are allowed in commercial areas so that innovative companies can grow without zoning getting in the way. And over the last few years, there's been some confusion as to which kinds of labs can locate in commercial areas versus locating in the city's industrial areas. So our proposal is to make it clear that if you're a life sciences business, unless you have the potential for environmental hazards, you are appropriate to locate in commercial areas. And we think that this makes, provides more clarity and confidence than currently exists. Next slide, please. Second, there's some situations which growing a new or growing business are looking to construct a new building and they run into a small zoning issue that would limit the shape of their building. So for example, film studios have struggled with zoning regulations like the minimum height a building hits before it has to start moving back towards the center. To address these kinds of zoning barriers, we're creating a pathway in zoning where if a business can locate in a district already, but can't build the shape of the building that they want, they can appeal to the city planning commission for relief from just that kind of zoning restriction. Next slide, please. Third, on nightlife, a few years ago, the city council removed the discriminatory cabaret laws from the city's administrative code, but zoning still prohibits dancing from occurring in many commercial areas of the city. Now we would like to get out of the business of having zoning regulate whether you can dance, but zoning also does other strange things. Like today, it makes distinctions on whether you can have musical acts that charge a cover to go on stage or even tell what time they're gonna go on the stage or whether you can have things like live comedy or an open mic night. So our proposal is to make more common sense reforms to these kinds of regulations that come out of the prohibition era. And what we would do is allow small venues to operate with dancing or live comedy and the way that they can already operate with live music today in the city's commercial districts. But we're also keeping in place size restrictions on businesses so that you can only see larger spaces in higher density or industrially zoned areas of the city. Next slide, please. Fourth, the way that zoning regulates amusements hasn't kept up with changes in 
things like trampoline parks, virtual skydiving, arcades, or virtual reality. And it basically restricts most kinds of amusements to the city's industrial areas or to Coney Island. And yet you can look to our neighbors to the north in Westchester or across the Hudson River to New Jersey, and you'll find all kinds of fun family activities that are allowed. And so what we're proposing is to simplify and modernize the way that our zoning thinks about these kinds of businesses. And we would allow them indoors and at a small scale along our neighborhood commercial corridors and at a larger scale and more centrally located or higher density areas like Midtown. Next slide, please. We're aware of the state's gaming commission's work on casinos and are continuing to work with City Hall and the New York City Council to understand whether there are zoning implications that would need to be addressed to enable this process. More to come on this at a later date. Next slide, please. Sixth and finally, there's a particularly arcane part of our zoning today, it's called enclosure rules. And it makes it sometimes confusing on when a business can have an outdoor component or be allowed to operate indoors. So for example, if you're a florist or a plant shop, it's unclear in our zoning today how much of your business can be outdoors on that part of your lot. And while zoning makes it clear that you can have outdoor urban agriculture or greenhouses in a commercial area, it's come to our attention that there may be some ambiguity in zoning as to whether indoor agriculture is allowed in some commercial areas. So we wanna clarify all this and say that if you're a florist or a plant shop, yes, you can operate part of your business outside. And if you want to do urban agriculture, yes, you can operate indoors just as you could in a greenhouse today. And so we wanna clarify this so that you can grow things like hydroponic tomatoes, or if you obtain a license from the state, grow hydroponic cannabis as well. Next slide, please. Each of the proposals under our third goal, fostering vibrant communities, touches on ways we want to enable zoning to increase the access that New Yorkers have to local goods and services. Next slide, please. First, outside of our commercial corridors, there are thousands of storefront businesses that dot our city's residential areas today. And these businesses provide vital access to local goods and services for folks who might live farther away from the nearest commercial street. But many of these storefronts predate our current zoning and are not allowed under a current zoning. And so what that means is that if one of these businesses were to go vacant and the storefront space were to go vacant for more than two years, in most residential areas of the city today, there's no way in zoning to reactivate and reoccupy this form of commercial space. And so it would have to remain vacant. And we think this is a clear example of our zoning contributing to storefront vacancy. And so we'd like to remove this two-year time clock and allow vacant storefronts to become reoccupied. Next slide, please. But there are parts of our city today where we don't have a commercial overlay or a commercial district. And so there's no path in zoning other than a full area-wide rezoning to allow for new neighborhoods serving storefronts to locate. So what we're proposing here is to create a path for a new corner store designation where within 100 feet of an intersection, or if you're in a large scale campus, you could apply to the city planning commission to create a new locally serving commercial space. Next slide, please. Third, we allow for a wide range of kinds of home occupations in our zoning today, but there are some very specific types of businesses that are not allowed to locate in the home. So for example, today you could be a lawyer or a music teacher and regularly have clients visit you in your home, but you couldn't be a barber or an interior designer. And so we wanna remove these inequities and update our regulations for home occupations to ensure that the, those that are currently restricted are allowed to operate. But making sure that we're still providing that you're a good neighbor, not having exterior signage, and you would have rules maintaining noise environment and selling items not produced on site. Next slide, please. Fourth, we have special streetscape rules that have been put in place in many of the city's special districts and rezonings that the city has done over the last 60 years. But vast parts of the city today have no rules whatsoever to prevent kinds of buildings that don't contribute to the economic vibrancy or are simply unpleasant or perhaps even unsafe for someone who wants to visit that storefront. And so this approach has created a patchwork in places where we do have rules and outside of places where we have rules in consistency. And so what we want to do is create a consistent and easy to understand baseline set of rules for commercial floor ground design. 
one that is more responsive to areas with greater pedestrian activity and more relaxed in the city's more auto-oriented commercial corridors. Next slide, please. Our next proposal has to deal with outdated and difficult to enforce regulations today around things like small-scale wholesale and storage businesses. And zoning today makes it hard to facilitate the kind of neighborhood-based hubs for safe and sustainable deliveries. So we'd clarify that small-scale wholesale and storage businesses are permitted in commercial areas, while also making sure that these spaces contribute to the vibrancy of their surrounding businesses through rules that we have put in place as part of the proposal I just mentioned to ensure that there are transparent windows in areas with greater pedestrian activity. Next slide, please. So our fourth and final goal is about modernizing and clarifying the rules that we have in zoning for use or the kinds of activities that zoning allows in a particular location. Next slide, please. First, in most cases, our use rules are more than 60 years old and have not been updated to reflect changes in business practices or how the economy has evolved. And so our regulations are full of antiquated and confusing terms that make it hard for small businesses to know where they can locate and what they can do in their space. For example, zoning is very clear on where a telegraph office is allowed to locate, but it's a lot less clear on where a cell phone repair shop can go. And so we're doing three things here to make it easier for small businesses, city agencies, and the general public to better understand this particularly unclear and outdated part of our zoning. We're first reorganizing the categories of uses that we have in zoning called use groups, into more coherent categories based on a similar business sector and building type, such as retail and service, offices, places of assembly, and manufacturing. At the same time, we're modernizing the terms or definitions that we have for retail, services, and manufacturing uses so that they better align with the city's current economy. This will make it easier for businesses, city agencies like the Department of Buildings, and New Yorkers to understand where businesses can locate. Third, we want to make sure that we're updating special district rules to refer to these new classifications. So this part of the proposal would not make changes to where businesses are allowed to locate, but it's all about clarity and modernizing the terms that we have in zoning for classifying our businesses. Next slide, please. So our final proposal is about modernizing our city's rules for existing buildings. Today, if a building tenant changes from offices to say one of the, the maker spaces or other small scale clean manufacturing businesses I mentioned earlier in the proposal, they would not be required to change the amount of parking they have to provide, but they may trigger a rule for additional loading docks, requiring this prospective tenant to have to cut an additional loading dock or two into the side of the building just to be able to occupy a space, regardless of how much loading the tenant might need or want. So adding additional unnecessary loading docks, it might be too expensive or simply not feasible for the building they're looking to occupy. And this results in more vacancy or underused space. And so we want to enable adaptive reuse of existing buildings by not requiring additional loading for a change of use. New buildings, however, would still have to add loading according to the appropriate mix of, of businesses in that building. Next slide, please. And so to wrap up with our, our um, timeline from here, after tonight, we'll have another public information session just under a month from now. We're gonna spend the next few months across the summer reaching as many people as we can, getting feedback on the proposal, answering questions you might have, and reaching as many businesses and organizations as we can. We're gonna come back after Labor Day and have a couple more info sessions to reflect and, and update you on the details of the proposal. And this is gearing up for the beginning of our public review, which will begin later this fall. That starts a roughly six month process where we'll be going out to all 59 community boards of the city and there will be a city council vote next spring. And with that, thank you so much for, for spending some time with us this evening. I know there are many things you could do on your Tuesday night. Um, so thank you for your interest in, in this initiative and in this process. And with that, we'd be happy to answer questions that you have.
Lara, you're on mute. Thank you, Matt, so much for that presentation. I'll do that again. <laughs> um, we are now going to open up for the Q&A portion of the evening where we can continue a conversation about economic opportunity through the City of Yes text amendments. As a reminder, you have multiple ways you can participate. You can continue to submit questions in the Q&A function, or you can raise your hand if you wish to ask your question using the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. When your name is called, you will be able to use the buttons to, in the left corner of your Zoom screen to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you'd like. If you're using the phone, and pressing star nine would be the way you would raise your hand and the staff will, um, will identify you by the last four digits of your phone number. Um, alternatively, you can between written, I'll alternate between written questions and those that we wanna ask questions verbally. Team, I can't see if there's raised hands um, on my screen. Uh, there are currently no raised hands. Um, we do have two questions in the chat or in the q and I'm sorry. Three. Uh, if anyone would like to use the raise hand feature, uh, it is at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so I'll start with um, questions that we're receiving in the Q&A chat. Um, the first question is, can I have a rec record of this record of this presentation? Um, yes, this is all being recorded. It will be on the DCP website um, as soon as, uh, as early as tomorrow. Um, the second question, without use groups, how will you determine standards for good neighbors, say for loud sound issues? Matt, can I put that over to you? Sure. Thanks, Lara. And thank you, Laura, for, for the question. So first thing I want to say is that our, our current regulations around things like sound, odor, and other kinds of ways that we use zoning to um, make sure that folks are being good neighbors, those will all still be in place. So we're not proposing any changes to those kinds of things. Second, on your question about use groups, though, we are recategorizing into more, more modern and coherent categories, all of the different uses that we have in zoning, but we're not changing where these uses apply. So that's, that's what I was talking about in our fourth goal at the end there, where we want to, we want to modernize our terms so that we're no longer talking about telegraph offices, but that our cell phone repair shops are, are certain that they know exactly where in zoning they can locate. And so today we want to replace that antiquated and ambiguous system with something that's a lot more modern. Um, and so I hope that answers both parts of your question. So I wanted to, to make sure that I, I touched on both of them. Thank you, Matt. Um, then the next question is about the draft zoning text, if it's available for public review. We haven't started the public review process and we're re really much in the space still taking in comments and ideas and having conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so we're here tonight to give you an idea of where the proposal is going and we wanna talk through um, the, you know, the, where we're at right now. Um, but we will have that text available um, as soon as we get closer to public review. Um, there is one more question, Matt, in the Q&A. Um, there's a lot to digest here. It is hard for me to understand how these changes will change or affect our community. Our community board doesn't meet over the summer and I'm worried we won't have enough time given the schedule to digest and process this, these changes. Can we have additional info sessions in October? Absolutely. We will be having um, many touch points come the fall um, and happy, I know your community board's not meeting over the summer, but we're happy to connect over the summer as well. Um, and that's not only for community boards, for any group or organization that would like to meet with us. I think we may have a few additional questions in the Q&A, uh, but we may want to ask if anyone would like to raise their hand again. Let's just give people a chance for that. 
Ah, we have one. Uh, and we have Sandy Hornet. Hi, Sandy. Let us know that you can hear us. Just give him one second. Just promoting him now. He should be back in one moment. Sandy, can you hear us? Sandy, you should be able to turn your microphone on. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so you, um, you just said something before that you weren't changing where uses are permitted, but during the presentation, you talked about sort of merging the distinctions between C1 and C2 discs, which I might add is long overdue. Um, but without a zoning text, how do we know what you are permitting where? Or do you have anything that is more detailed than that general explanation? Matt, do you want Thank to? You. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for the follow-up question, Sandy, and giving me uh, a chance to clarify what I what I meant earlier to avoid any confusion. So, in our first goal, um, these are all changes that we're proposing in zoning that would allow for. Um, businesses to locate in areas where we believe it's appropriate for them to locate. So you mentioned allowing currently business types that are in C2 districts to be similar to business types allowed in C1 districts. We agreed that this is a change that's long overdue and something that would uh, make it easier for businesses to understand where they can locate in contexts that are very similar. Now, your, your second part of your question on updating and modernizing that in our fourth goal is where we're just taking the existing list of uses that we have in our zoning, hundreds of them, and making them so that they relate to more modern types of industries and more modern types of buildings. And so these are two distinct things that we're going to be working on the details of in coming months, which is precisely why we don't yet have the um, the detailed line item changes of, of what will be happening in our zoning. And that's by intent. We're, we're having these info sessions several months ahead of when we will actually have the, the finalized zoning text precisely because we want feedback, we want questions, and we want to understand, um, are we getting these proposals right? We spent the last year speaking with stakeholders about things that might be, how zoning might be getting in the way of businesses now we've come together with some, some ideas, some solutions to how we might um, solve some of those issues for businesses. And so now we wanna continue to work together on some of those details. And so that's why we don't yet have the, the text, it's by, by intent. Um, so we have plenty of time between now and the beginning of public review to get into more depth. I hope that answers uh, all three parts of your question. Uh, as far as you're going, yes, that's all. Okay, thank you, Sandy. I believe there's another hand raised. Am I yes. correct? Uh, we have Laura Singer. Thank you. Uh, Mike managers, please promote. She should be back in the room in a moment. Laura, can you hear us? You should be able to unmute. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm from, uh, I'm the district manager for community board 15 in Brooklyn which has special districts in Sheepshead Bay and at Ocean Parkway. So I'm wondering, are you looking at special districts also because some of the uses are antiquated. Mm -hmm. Sheepshead Bay was a fishing village. So a lot of the uses were for fishing um, items, the stores. So have you looked at these special districts as well? Yeah, thank you for the question, Laura, and, and for your, your interest in, in CB15 in Brooklyn. Um, as we typically do with any citywide change to our zoning, we also want to make sure that we're making changes that are consistent with our, our um, special district. So in, in your case, you highlight the fact that there are some antiquated uh, uses in the special district in Sheepshead Bay. And so we'd love to work with you on this, is, is the short answer to my question. And 
where you think that there are particularly antiquated uses and we have an opportunity to make sure that we're, we're updating that special district text as well. Thank so please you. be in touch. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so I think we'll go back to the Q&A chat. Um, it's a question about, do these initiatives around adaptive reuse and conversion of vacant space apply to office to residential conversions as well? Yeah, thanks for the question on that. Um, conversions are, are legal in much of the city today, but, but city planning recently completed a, a work on a series of city and state recommendations that would help to enable office conversions to residential in a, a variety of different conditions. Um, and so some of these changes may be a component of future city of yes for housing opportunity process, but not, not this current initiative. Thank you, Matt. So the next question, um, if an entrepreneur wants to activate a space as a pop-up event space to support local small businesses in modernizing the zoning categories, are you including this type of property use? Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, and it's definitely something that we see more and more of, and we want to make sure that we're, we're allowing for, for a temporary occupation of space. So in zoning, temporary uses generally have to comply with zoning rules that are in place for that location. So giving more flexibility to our, our rules overall would consequently make it easier for different types of pop-up spaces to locate as well. Um, and this is definitely an instance where if you ever have any questions around how zoning does or does not apply to a particular space, the, the agency has a zoning help desk that would be happy to, to answer any specific questions you might have. So please, again, don't hesitate to reach out uh, so we can be a resource and a help for you. Thank you. Just want to confirm a team. Is there anybody with a raised hand? We do have one raised hand currently. We have Yun Lee. Yun, you'll be promoted shortly. She should be back in the room any moment. Thank you, Tom. Yun, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? You're a little faint. Um, how about right now? Perfect. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I think my question is like, um, there is one proposal. It's about like, we're going to allow the live music and also like, I mean, probably uh, dancing activities, I mean, um, in certain commercial district, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. Uh, it's just like one case I heard I'd like to share with you. It's just like, I mean, uh, I know like a property, they have the, they have a karaoke space in their basement and above that space, it's like all, uh, it's a hotel. Uh, so what happened is like, I mean, so the, they did all the, uh, uh, like, I mean, they, they trying to avoid the sounds, I mean, to be, uh, transferred out of the, the karaoke room, but eventually it's like all the units in the hotel above were all affected by this karaoke in the basement. So eventually the hotel operator have to just abandon this hotel. He just have to terminate his lease with the landowner and move to somewhere else. It's just like some case I'd like to share with you. Probably we can try to make sure if our technology is at once enough to, uh, uh, to avoid this happen. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah. Matt, do you want to just cover a little bit about the process for sure. virtual spaces? Sure. And, and thank, yeah, and thank you for, for sharing this, uh, this story and um, for giving some more detail on, on the interaction between these kinds of businesses. So um, first of all, I want to make sure that we're clear on what the, the current uh, regulations are. So today, in, in most parts of the city, you can have live music. So you would be able to have karaoke in, in most uh, commercial areas of the city today. Um, but 
for places where that that bar might not be being a good neighbor, we do have processes in place through the state liquor authority, um, which is is granted liquor licenses, and that's an opportunity to. Uh, ensure that these kinds of businesses are being a good neighbor and there are stipulations that can be put in place as part of that process that would help um, help ensure that 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 business is doing what it should be. Now, what this proposal would do is not make any changes to existing regulations as far as live music, but would simply allow people to start dancing to that live music. Um, and so what we would keep in place is a distinction where a small venue, and we're defining small as, as about the size of a, a standard storefront. So say roughly 200 people, this is an existing uh, distinction our zoning makes between small neighborhood sized venues and larger ones. And so today, live music is allowed at a, at a neighborhood scale um, in any commercial district of the city. Um, and so this would simply keep that existing threshold in place and ensure that larger spaces are only in certain higher density, centrally located parts of the city. So I think this is definitely a place where we want to make sure that we're, we're bringing to bear all the resources that the city has generally. We've worked extensively with the mayor's office of nightlife to craft a proposal that, that balances um, the, 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 the needs of, of neighbors and as well as nightlife businesses being able to, to grow and expand. And so for this instance specifically, I would really encourage you to, to reach out to the mayor's office of nightlife. They have a team set in place for mediating exactly these kinds of situations and can help make sure that businesses can coexist and thrive together. Thank you for the question. So I'm gonna go back. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go back to the Q&A chat. Um, what is the referral action that takes place in October on the timeline? So the referral action um, begins the official land use public review process. Um, once the city planning commission has referred the document to the process, um, it will go to the community boards, it will go to the borough presidents for a 60 day review. Once that review is complete, um, we will have a public hearing at the Planning Commission. Um, when, after the public hearing, we will have um, following in January um, in this timeline, the, the Planning Commission will vote on the referred um, proposal. Uh, at the end of once the CPC, which is the Planning Commission has voted, the city council will then be able to vote on it, which is about a 50 day clock on that. So it begins a several month process for multiple um, uh, entities within the, uh, the process, the, the community board, the borough presidents, um, the public review at the planning commission and the city council to all review and vote on, on the proposal. Matt, I think this next question is gonna be for you. Um, hopefully you've seen, I think you've seen it, um, a recent article in the patch um, that indicated uh, the city is moving towards allowing major amusement park rides like you might see in Coney Island in Midtown Manhattan. Is that a type of change intended in the amusement proposal that you spoke about? Sure, and, and thanks for the, the question on this. So as, as I understand the situation in the article, uh, the Department of Buildings considered Times Square, this Times Square building's amusement to be part of a larger hotel, similar to how a restaurant or an arcade would be today. Um, zoning already allows many free fo standing forms of, of entertainment in this area like Times Square. And what the proposal would do is um, it, it would allow the, the it would allow a wider range of kinds of indoor amusements where really what we're talking about are, are family friendly, small scale kinds of things like children's arcades or for um, things like a, a, a virtual reality type of, of arcade. And so we're, we're recognizing that, um, that the, this, as many kinds of businesses are changing, they're looking for new business models. And so we'll look more into this situation. Um, but yeah, this, thank you for raising it. And it's something that we just saw today. 
All right, great. Um, going to ask again, team, if there's any raised hands. We do not currently have any raised hands. All right. Um, so then I will, um, hold on, I'm just pulling up the next question. Um, so Matt, the next question is about street wall design rules. Um, you know, we've heard uh, this person recognizes that um, they're glad to hear that it's uh, the that the proposal has street wall design rules for more vibrant corridors. But you mentioned that these rules would be more relaxed in an auto oriented area. Um, in this person's experience, these areas are generally more wa unwalkable and unpleasant today, and perhaps need more intervention. Why not extend those same design rules to auto oriented areas too? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question, Kate, it's a great one. Um, so this proposal, it's looking to expand commercial streetscape protection to all areas of the city for the first time and doing so in response to the conditions on the ground today. So some auto-oriented areas have more parking, larger stores, a different character. And we're looking to improve that, but not put in place citywide rules that may not match existing building types and therefore not work well. So this is not to say that city planning doesn't look to work with communities to transform streets as well. Uh, and we work with our colleagues at DOT to achieve that through more neighborhood focused initiative. So over time, um, it's, it's our hope that we can work with communities, work with our sister agencies and, and respond to the kinds of things that you're raising. So thank you very much for the question. All right, thank you, Matt. Um... To move on to one more question that's uh, in the chat. Um, Matt, it's just asking to expand a little bit on the casino zoning plans. Uh, what kind of areas would be deemed appropriate for such zoning? Um, and our neighborhoods like Coney Island uh, were such a plant, part of this plan? Sure. Um, thanks for the question, Laura. This is one area where we do not have more details this evening, but we're working through with colleagues at, in the city and, and the state to further understand how the state process will unfold and where and whether it has zoning implications. Great, and so um, there's a follow-up question just asking about if uh, casinos become as of right, um, and I believe there's still a state process. Is that correct, Matt? Yes, that's right. So the, the state is very clear that, um, that the, the process for, for loading a locating a casino any place in the state has to go through a public process. And so that public process involves robust community input. Um, and so I, I would just refer to the state in their process in this. Thank you so much. Um, Tom, I believe you uh, said that there's one more hand up. Yes, we did have a raised hand, but it just, uh, oh yes, it came back. Uh, <laughs> our next question is from Jim Wright. Jim, you'll be promoted shortly. Here we go. Uh, hi, uh, Jim Wright. Um, I'm an architect and I do some work in industrial areas um, of this city. And my question has to do with uh, use groups for uh, large um, industrial buildings that are used for distribution centers, um, such as Amazon. Um, are you, as you're looking at the use groups, there, there currently is not an appropriate use group for that use. Are you, in addition to modernizing how it's categorized within the code, which I definitely support, are you also looking at modernizing the use groups themselves to more closely uh, fit current, current operations at, at specifically uh, distribution centers, um, areas like that. Yeah. yeah, thanks Thanks for that question, Jim. There's a, a few parts to it, so I wanna uh, make sure I, I break them apart. So first on, on use groups, generally our, our aim is to take existing definitions and terms that we have in zoning for uses and bring them into the 21st century. Because today, most of the use definitions that we have are from 1961, and that was planners working off of early 20th century 
uh, understandings of how industries were. So you can imagine, and you're highlighting one example, but of many in which are just the, the terms, the legal definitions that we have in our zoning are just decades and decades out of date. It creates all sorts of ambiguity. It also makes it harder to regulate when there are, there are changes in business practices. Um, and all of this just costs businesses time and money and also is confusing for, for New Yorkers. And so we want to add clarity and certainty to the process for everyone involved. Um, and so that's, that's on that part of the question. And around things like, like distribution in particular, um, it, it's our understanding that there are uh, particular and unique needs for, for distribution facilities that are, are last mile in nature. And so this has to be studied at a, a neighborhood level across the city and likely would be addressed as part of a, a separate application simply because of the, um, the, the technical term in zoning, the environmental review and the lengthier public process that this would entail. So it's something that we're looking at and it's been brought to our attention. Um, and so uh, it's not part of this proposal, but we're, we're looking at it. Uh, thanks. How, how would one keep track of your discussions on that topic? Yeah, I, I would say feel free to email us at economic opportunity at planning.nyc.gov and we can Make sure that we're, we're keeping you updated for uh, this project in particular, but our work generally. The other place where I would encourage you to, to sign up is we'll have um, both updates on our website as well as a regular newsletter that we put out for some of our initiatives. And so those are all ways that you can stay in touch. And then, uh, Lara, I'm not sure if there's any other ways that, that Jim can stay involved and updated. Those are really the best ways, you know, just connect with us directly through the email and we'll make sure that you have access um, and ability to get to the newsletter um, and to the website. Okay. And we'll, have, we'll have more conversations like this as well throughout the, the summer and the fall. So um, if you sign up for our uh, mailing list, um, you'll be able to get that information through there and through our social media. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll give you all a few seconds if there's more questions. Tom, I, I'm not sure if there's a hand raised. We don't have any raised hands. Okay. Well, I really want to first off thank you, Matt, for um, walking us through the points of um, this incredible proposal through economic opportunity. Um, I want to also thank Edith for joining us. Um, and then of course, thank all of you for, for joining. And um, like we just said in the last answer to the question, please stay in touch with us. Uh, the email address is economicopportunity at planning.nyc.gov. Um, you can sign up through for our newsletter through there um, and as well as through our website. Um, and you can also uh, follow us on Instagram and Twitter to see um, any updates on the proposals or meetings that might be coming up. And so with that, I think we can um, move on. Thank you all so much for this evening. Thank you everyone.